Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ram Mohan and uh, Mr. Damodaran for this opportunity. And I'm glad uh, to be associated with Chinmaya's initiative for uh, this civil services training uh, program. Uh, uh, I'm sh sure that, uh, a lot of people would have, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately missed out because of the rain. And uh, it's not only Chennai, even in Delhi, which is the capital, one heavy shower, the whole city comes to a standing still. So <laughs> uh, one can, uh, you know, uh, anyway, can't, you know, blame the weather. Uh, uh, so this is something we, we can always catch up. And being the first uh, lecture for uh, this, and I'm glad to see the students here. Uh, I'm keeping it quite simple and focus mainly on explaining the Dokla issue so that people get a good understanding. Uh, but when we move on to the question and answer, you want to get into more details, we can, you know, uh, discuss a lot of things. Okay, uh, let's uh, start uh, this uh, issue with what are really the issues with India and China. You want to, these slides probably you can, not that, the rear ones you can keep it on, here you can put it off. Yeah, fine, that's fine, okay. What happened? Some switch has gone off? Okay. Uh, I thought I'll just give you a little overview and delve into a bit of history. Uh, uh, to understand what really is the problem between India and China, is there a problem or has a problem been created because of certain uh, environmental international issues or is it age-old problem between the two civil countries? We are two of the oldest civilizations on earth. Both have been fairly, you know, uh, independent of each other. And uh, uh, the Chinese civilization has evolved pretty independent of the Indian civilization or uh, Hindu civilization that evolved in the subcontinent. And geography has played a major part in the entire process. So if you look at the map of India and uh, the geographical barriers that were naturally set up, and if you, you all must have read, you all are aware that the Indian subcontinent is a later addition into the Asian mainland. Are you all aware of that? Okay, it's the youngest region of the Asian mainland. So it is something that was part of the old ancient Gonda land and has moved up and is rammed into the Asian mainland. And that ramming has pushed up the hills, hills, and that is why you have the tallest hill ranges, or uh, the mountain ranges, Himalayas, you know, bordering us in the north. And they are the youngest mountains in, in, in geological terms. And that is also the reason why those regions, starting off from the Gulf of uh, uh, Cambe or the Gujarat coast, down to the northeast, is a highly prone seismic zone. They come under a seismic factor of four or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, it is a natural barrier, and the mountains go up to the Everest is almost 30,000 feet, 29,000, uh, you know, some feet uh, high. Most of the mountain ranges over the 2,000 mile long range average about 20,000 feet. The highest mountain in the rest of the world is 15, 16,000 feet. One is in uh, Black Forest, the other one is in Andes, and that's about all. Well, the majority of the mountains range between 10 and 12,000 feet. Okay, and mostly it's below 10,000 feet. So the Indian topography is completely different. The Tibetan and Pamirs is called the roof of the world, right? So the uh, barriers, natural barriers to the subcontinent, if you take, you have the Hindu Kush on the west, you have the Arakan mountains. As they dip down, as you go down to the Myanmar, from 20,000 feet, 25,000 feet, it starts coming down to about 4,000 feet, and then moves into about a flat terrain on the Myanmar region, the Arakan hills, 
which are much lower ranges, but the forests are extremely thick, impenetrable. Some of the trees are average about 100 meters high, and you must actually fly and or travel on on the ground to see the density of the tropical jungles there. Okay, they are rich, extremely beautiful jungles. Okay, so you have that barrier there. You have the sea on three sides. India has one of the longest coastlines in the world. Okay, and therefore you have a subcontinent. More importantly, most civilizations evolved on river banks, and that is history. Whether it's Egypt on Nile or the Indian subcontinent on Ganges, Indus, and I'll come to the subcontinent later. Then you have the Yellow River, the Yangtze in the Chinese side, okay, and Euphrates, Tigris, and in warm climate regions largely because the technology wasn't there to, to protect people, and therefore. And genetics now corroborate this entire process. So human civilization has moved from Africa into southern Asia, moved upwards and then branched off into Europe and into Southeast Asia. It's completely different from the nonsense of Aryan invasion theory that's been peddled by the colonialists for such a long time. All this changes the picture completely. So water is essential as hunter-gatherer uh, you know, populations convert themselves into static populations and get into agriculture. They start building permanent dwellings. They become, they build cities and they evolve communities, societies, and then civilizations evolve. So, if you look at the Indian subcontinent, perennial rivers are extremely important. So, Himalayan glaciers were important for Indus and Ganges and all the other rivers that come along. Brahmaputra comes along here. But you know, as you move down into the peninsula, you had perennial rivers as well, down to Kaveri. And therefore, it wasn't just the Gangetic Valley civilization, it was a civilization that, ex that spanned the whole subcontinent. And they were, and that is also the reason why India had so much of diversity in terms of language developments and subcultural developments. And therefore, it was, and some people would call it as a multinational state. But it's, it is a single civilization unity that binds each of those subcultures, and that is one of the most important things. So diversity was a significant factor in the Indian civilization. How was the Chinese? The common perception, what do you all think? Chinese is a uni, uh, a single you know, language, single community civilization. Everybody has a common perception that hands form the 80% of the population. What's the truth? The truth is, when China evolved, it evolved pretty much like us. And it started off in the Yellow River, in the Yangtze River, and the Pearl River, eastern coast region. Much of the rivers, like the Himalayan glaciers, were the source of Ganges and Indus river you know, uh, systems in the northern India. All the rivers, three river systems starts off from the Tibetan Plateau and flow eastwards into the Chinese mainland. And that is one of the fundamental strategic reasons why China Modern China has said Tibet must be integral to China. Okay, uh, so the civilization has evolved there in pretty much in many communities, many languages, unified by a single script, and then brought in the unification during the Warring States period. And there's a hierarchy model, which brings in the Middle Kingdom concept, the Eastern uh, you know, plains brings in the mandate of heaven concept. What is mandate of heaven? The, it actually goes into a practical philosophy. And the mandate of heaven is about, you know, if the ruler is just, gives a good administration to its people, governs well, protects them well, then he is fit enough to be the ruler. And he has a mandate of heaven to be the ruler. And that is actually the meaning of the mandate of heaven. The corollary of that is, People have the right to change the ruler, and therefore it's not a hereditary dynastic process. Although you had many dynasties ruling China, but the essence of Chinese philosophy was practical. And therefore, the Confucian and other philosophy that evolved later emphasized and strengthened this fundamental idea that the leader is, does not have an automatic right to inherit the kingdom or inherit the rule. He has to be fit enough to be approved by the people some sort of a democracy ideals. You know, it looks a little contrary to the whole understanding of China, but that was the mandate of heaven. On the other hand, Indian civilization moved much more spiritual. So if you look at Confucius theory, 
and Confucius philosophy, who was the, author, who was the pioneer for the bureaucratic concept of bureaucracy. The Chinese were the leaders in evolving the bureaucracy. And the, the whole process was about education, be learner, be humane, and live for today, and pay your respects to the ancestors, but don't worry about higher spiritual, you know, discussions and higher spiritual issues. So Chinese culture evolved pretty much on a practical aspect, whereas Indian civilization focused on higher philosophy, spiritual development, and therefore you have Upanishads, your uh, Indian philosophy, or the Buddhism, or the other religions flourished here. There were no religion that evolved in China, other than these three philosophies of Confucius and the other two philosophies which are more ra radical. Taoism. So that shows up in how leaders behave, how leaders behave later. Second is, as the uh, state evolved, India remained because of its higher spiritual nature in terms of allowing people to explore and find out the truth for themselves and much of diversity has continued to be encouraged. China began to integrate under a hierarchical model and the Confucian you know, philosophy has actually helped that entire process. So by 2nd, 3rd century BC, China became a single emperor kingdom. And you had people who had conquered and set up dynasty, that's a different issue. But throughout its history, it's been a single emperor kingdom. Okay, so if you look at, uh, let's say, the uh, population distribution and linguistic groups, this is the kind of diversity that shows up. And much of the uh, population is all in this region. 80% of the population live here in one third of China. And two thirds of China remains occupied by about 20 percent, which is now changing because of changing technologies and the government forcibly changes people to create a new demographic, you know, pattern in this entire process. Okay. Now, if, if you really want to understand what is the core China, this is the core, uh, cradle of Chinese civilization, the region that I spoke about, and the other one is the uh, cr uh, core, this entire region becomes the core China. Rest of it comes into a m idea called frontier regions. What happened? The Chinese language itself Yeah, okay, okay. The uh, civilization is largely uh, practical in, in, in application of uh, the ideas and philosophies. The development of language itself is a proof of this entire process. You know, the uh, if you take the three fundamental, you know, descriptions of a geographical feature. The word Shan signifies mountain, and uh, He is river. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? And this is uh, uh, Jing, which is uh, town. And the entire cradle and core region, if you look at all the names of provinces and towns, they will all be in relation to this fundamental in the process. Similarly, the uh, direction is given in terms of, you know, the north cardinal directions. And uh, so, correlating the direction and the geographical features, most of the names will give you an easy understanding of the Chinese geography. So, Shandong is a uh, mountain, you know, the province east of that mountain, you know, Shandong. Shangzi is a province west of the mountain. Similarly, Hebei is a land north of the river. Henan is the land south of the river. Similarly, Beijing is a town in the north. And Nanjing is a town in the south. Simple, straightforward. Throughout history, all their names have remained, you know, correlated to 
you know practical aspects of how you know uh, uh, meanings have been ascribed to words okay now this is the cradle and see the names much in the same lines that i've explained to you okay and the core is the larger region pretty much the same pattern why did they have the idea of periphery and frontier regions this was the han china or this was the ko china and this was also the richest fertile region and much of the times they were actually hampered by invaders from the north the nomads and from the west and therefore their idea was to create buffer zones who will take the initial shock and then you know they will be able to deal with the diffused invasion process by themselves subsequently so the frontier and peripheral region concept came in in that and that brings in the chinese hierarchy model so what did so you have tibet and uh, xinjiang and the inner mongolia that comes in as uh, two thirds of the modern china region as a periphery and the relationship was hierarchical so you have the middle kingdom to whom they would have probably invaded once have him accept their suzerainty and then all he had to do is the yearly ritual of bringing in maybe two flowers to pay obeisance and do the dance accepting as a master and go back rest of the regions were pretty much autonomous and they were independent and that's so when you now come back to the problem between india and china the problem is tibet india and china never had a border because the core china never had a border we are thousands of miles separated away from us tibet had a border with us the yunnan province probably had a border to some extent but they were all peripheral regions okay so what changed in 1911 the monarchy was displaced you you heard of sanyat sen sanyat sen came and changed set up the republic and the republic brought in the idea in tune with the 500 year old what is known as the colombian approach in tune with what is known as the modern nation state and the modern nation state is a territorial nation state needs defined borders and the size of the state and strength of the population and national nation state concepts were essential to be counted as a viable nation state in the international system and that was at the fundamental core of the modern evolving the modern nation state idea and therefore the chinese build up this habit of historicity go back into history go back into their relationships even 2000 years back and say we've had dealings with these regions we've actually controlled these regions and they are our territory and that's how they define the entire territory it's bigger than us obviously the population is bigger than us and this definition was done as early as 1890 it was only taken up to be strengthened further mosetting was a practical realist and he is a guy who said in 1949 this is how china will be he just confirmed what sanyatsen had actually put down in 1911 12 and therefore modern china is this 28 provinces see the core idea that the core china still remains the cradle and core that i've explained still remains even in their own definition and this is china's definition 28 provinces seven productive populates and long integrated core provinces that's the core that i've defined for you 11 peripheral provinces traditionally less productive less populous and less historically integrated provinces lying at the extremities many of them large provinces and circuit of 11 peripheral provinces within which lies 17 core provinces of which the five most northerly comprise the cradle provinces this is the final definition of modern nation state of china okay so this is the essential issue and therefore when you now come on to india china boundary dispute you need to go into understanding the history that i've just explained there is much more there is a lot more to talk but for time i've just kept it concise you need to understand that modern international system is a system of states defined by westphalian territoriality and you need to understand the concept of westphalian nation state definition which is all about sovereignty state that is the government and territorial nature of that state 
and we are also into that trap. So there is a problem between civilizations in Asia which have dealt with borders in a different manner, in a different civilizational cultural context. That is why you had a free flow of traffic, free flow of philosophy, free flow of religion between Tibet and India. There were no defined borders because there was never a problem. That is why Nalanda had 60% of the monks from Tibet at one time. Okay, now that is why people traveled. So China, historically, China continues to accept, even modern China accepts, that Buddhism and much of philosophical strengths came from India to China. And the route was, one is the oceanic route from the peninsula down to the eastern coast, but the major route was the northern route through Tibet. And Tibet was the conduit for this entire process. And therefore, the modern Westphalian territoriality brings in a divisive process in the Asian cultural milieu, civilizational milieu. And why did that happen? Because it came all of a sudden. I would say it is imposed. In some countries who had the far-sightedness, you know, the Chinese were smarting from the humiliation. They are very proud civilization. They were smarting from the humiliation of the opium wars and, and the, how the Europeans have dealt with them. That's why even now, Historically, they continued to emphasize upon 100 years of humiliation. And they were, they've understood the Westphalian issues. And mind you, as late as, as early as late 19th century and early 20th century, a lot of Chinese went abroad, studied in the US, studied in Europe. And therefore, education, they were, the prime leaders were well educated. And these ideas were, they quite naturally adopted the Westphalian territorial model because the ambition and vision was to regain the lost glory. And therefore, in the case of China, it was an aspired model of Westphalian territoriality. In the case of India, it was an imposed borders. And therefore, we were divided into three countries. They became borders of conflict. Even in aspired cases, it becomes a border of conflict, borders of conflict. And therefore, that is an issue. The Tibet border conflict emanates from this entire process. We had, you all know about the 62 war, and Henderson Brooks report is available in the open. Those of you who want to, it's difficult to, for people who have no military background experience to understand, but just for the commentaries you can read, and thereafter you can, as you get into better experiences with research process, you probably can do that. 62 was a humiliation. Why was it a humiliation? Fundamentally because of, again, the civilizational context. The independence movement kept the military role away. And the military was the British, seen as the British Raj military. But if you go back into history, modern India, you wouldn't have had a modern India to have an independence movement but for the Indian Army. The British used the Indian Army to integrate India all across. That's a fundamental truth that is not given an acknowledgement. The second part, the 47 independence came while the independence movement by, led by Gandhi and Nehru and everybody played a major role. But many other factors played an important role for the British to hurriedly give away the independence. One of the most important you know, motivators for that process was Subhash Chandra Bose's INA. Okay, the INA triggered many other things. But not only they fought in the Second World War, but the leadership of Subhash Chandra Bose was extremely important. That's one. Bhagat Singh's and the underground Bengal movement, they were violent movement. Subhash Chandra Bose believed violence is the only way through which independence can have a meaning for modern India. The second part was, I told you, the INA, after the Second World War, when it was being now tried, it created great dissatisfaction. Who were INA? It's people from the Indian Army who went out and who went under the leadership of, uh, you know, Subhash Chandra Bose. So when that was initiated, you had a naval mutiny in 1946. You had murmurs of an impending army mutiny in the Indian Army. And the British realized, now in 1857, it's not the same story again. This is Indian Army and Indian Navy mutinying and Indian Air Force joining in. If that happens, not one Britisher would go back alive. And there was no question of British being able to retain the jewel in the crown. 
That's one of the fundamental movers to actually grant independence in 18, 1947. I'm bringing this out fundamentally because you need a national narrative in the correct picture to be built to motivate people to have, you need, to allow people to demand the right decision-making process in, in the case of national security. So 62 fiasco is also an, one that emanated from poor understanding at the political leadership level, poor decision-making, and poor importance given to the need for preparing well and creating adequate force structure, reading the enemy's or the adversary's intentions, and appreciating it correctly. And therefore, all those failures culminated in a very poor process in 62. They learned the lessons. You managed to create a stalemate when Pakistan tried to take advantage of the interregnum, where we were in a transformational process. Lal Badu Shastri took good decisions to actually expand the you know, war, and, and, and Pakistan was dealt with quite well. 67 is a great transformation. In the same region where we have the dispute today, nearby, Natula, the Chinese tried the same trick, and they got a bloody nose. It's not advertised greatly. <coughs> this time, the Indian Army and the Indian Artillery demolished a brigade headquarters. They had massive, massive casualties, and they were actually moved back. You know, they just acknowledged the position and moved back. They never actually went into an adventure in the Sikkim region until now. 87 is an interesting one. 87, we had brass tacks on one side, which General Sundarji conceived that. But the Chinese tried to create a problem after that in the Eastern Theater, again in the same region. That's when he mobilized in a big way through an exercise called checkerboard. And the checkerboard created great apprehensions in the minds of the Chinese. They just moved back without actually creating any problems further. So this is not the first time we are having problems. Problems with Chinese have been more or less continuous. And we've dealt with it quite well, extremely well. And 2017, let's come to that picture now. So the dispute areas are there indicated in this map. OK? You can see. Is there a pointer anywhere? No, that's right. OK. This is the park occupied Kashmir, and this is the Karakoram region. This is that 2,500 square miles ceded by uh, Pakistan illegally to China in 1963. This is the region through which China wants to build the CPEC corridor down to Gwadar here. And this is a bone of contention, because India has raised a lot of objections because it is India's area, illegally occupied by Pakistan and illegally ceded to China, and therefore CPEC is just not acceptable. But the two countries, China and Pakistan, have colluded and gone ahead and they are building it there. And therefore it's a serious bone of contention because it actually questions India's sovereignty in this region. And therefore it's completely unacceptable to India. The other region is, of course, Aksai Chin, which was occupied in 59, uh, 58, 59, and because of which we went to war in 62. And that can, remains disputed. So the line that we hold, the blue line, is the line of actual control. And they have continued to dispute small, small pockets of land all along, right down to the Nepalese border here. Then, of course, Doklam, we'll, I'll come to that later. The entire Arunachal Pradesh is, you know, disputed by them. It is completely in our control. They can continue to dispute, but that's the region through which they just flowed down, right down to Tezpu, not Tezpur, I would say Mizamari, uh, in 1962. But our defenses there are extremely strong. And while they keep raising this issue, quite often it is a strategic issue that they keep dealing with in terms of, you know, raise the temperature this side, and then we will probably be able to bargain on other areas. Fundamentally, and strategically, this is the understanding. The accession is vital for China for its communications, road links to in further in Tibet in the north and Uyghur. Both these regions are soft underbelly of the Chinese. They continue, even after 50 years of controlling it, they continue to have 
you know, suspicions and problems in, 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 they don't have the full confidence in the entire process. They are now bringing in massive amounts of technology. You have the trains that are coming in right up to Lhasa and further down to Nepalese border. But you have fabulous roads that are built there. But unless people are with you in 100%, even with a demographic change, you will continue to have suspicions on the entire process. And to top it, Dalai Lama lives in India. There's a Tibetan exile government that functions from Dharmashala. And these are factors that are great irritants in the relations between these two countries. The uh, uh, other issue is, therefore, the general perception is they want to continue to push India to a situation where they will say, okay, we won't make noise on Arunachal Pradesh, you leave this area. This has been one of the conceptions for some time. But I think it's much more than that, which I'll come to it later. Okay? These are uh, more elaborate maps, exception on the left and Arunachal Pradesh on the right. People uh, can, I leave this uh, map uh, slides, you all can actually go through it more uh, in greater clarity. This, this is everything I've explained. This is another explanation, the bone of contention in each of these regions in Ladakh and as well as in Arunachal Pradesh is explained in greater detail in this slide. Let me now come on to Chum, the Doklam issue. Doklam is an uh, issue relates to what is known as the Chumbi Valley. Chumbi Valley, you see a dagger-like shape of the land that's Judson here. This is Nepal. Old, uh, this is the Sikkim state here. This is Bhutan. You have what's called as a chicken snake. The uh, Rajesh from the army will be able to explain all this uh, to you. You have Bangladesh. The and here you have Northeast, the seven states that come in there. If this region gets cut off, you know the connection is made between Bangladesh and China here, and you cut it off, your Northeast gets cut off. That's the that's the simple layman's understanding of a straightforward implication of what, how vital is that region. Okay. The current process or the current problem emanates with respect to the border disputes with Bhutan and China, between Bhutan and China in this region. And there is a topographical feature that actually will allow you to understand better why it's an important issue to India as well. The Chumbi Valley is, is a narrow valley. It's about 500 to 600 meters wide. Am I right, Rajesh? And uh, it's quite a deep valley, high hills. And uh, the Chinese have built, uh, you know, roads as you'll see in some of the other regions, in some of the other slides. And uh, therefore, the, it's of a vital importance to us. Okay, this is uh, the uh, more expanded map for you to have a better understanding. Uh, you see where Gangtok is on the left, and you have Darjeeling is in between there. Kanchenjunga is one of the tallest peaks that side. Okay. Uh, the, this is the uh, Bhutanese border. This is the Chinese road that comes here. There's another road that comes here. I'll show you on the other slide. This is the valley. This is the tri-junction. As China claims, this is where the tri-junction should be. I mean, uh, as we claim, and China claims this is where the tri-junction is. So he actually claims, I'll show you in another slide, a land border that comes in like this. And this is a, between the valley on one side, there's a top plateau here, and this is where he wants to build the road and come up right up to your point. Okay. The Chinese have a, you know, highlighted their problems with Bhutan in terms of significant areas of territory and they keep changing their stance over the years. So against five odd earlier, in the 90s and earlier, from 90s onwards, they have actually increased the number. There are seven regions in which they say we have, you know, they claim the territories. The territories that they claimed are shown in, in blue. You know, this is the original border and this is an area that they claim here. Similarly, you see where the blue border, blue line is running, that's the line where they say, uh, the, the red line is the line where they say the Chinese border should be, now, with, uh, with respect to Bhutan. Now, if you expand 
this map and see a little topographical you know depiction i'm not sure if you all would be able to understand it's a valley it's a steep valley it's a narrow valley as i said and uh, you have two roads that are coming in here this is a, this is the yeah this is another road this is another road and thereafter there's a single road that comes in into the entire process so you have dokla here and gimochen this is the point which chinese say the trijunction should move back here and we say the trijunction is somewhere here let me show you in another map okay uh, same another view of dokla and gimochen here this is another better one to show you the distances between you know vital areas is indicated here from the area of that is under dispute and from where they have actually claimed those regions if you accept their borders then you are just about you know 10 kilometers away on one side 20 kilometers away on another side on the sikkim and west bengal side and through bhutan it just reduces by another 16 to 18 kilometers and that is a little tricky the uh, Uh, the roads that are there because it's a valley the number of roads that you can have is limited and the chinese access roads are as indicated here the, the red line is one set of roads and the white line runs all along the butnis border and again to this point this is chimbi and the valley width is just about 500 meters as i said earlier and from a chinese military perspective because they are not sky i mean they are not at the heights because they have to now move through the valley quite obviously they are being monitored by the indian army at all times and they also cannot move in great strength and and that will give them a, a tremendous disadvantage by trying to get a plateau which is on the higher side on one side which is the dokla plateau that disadvantage will get neutralized they'll create some kind of a parity with indian army positions and that is completely unacceptable to to us as well okay so here are our you no know, different positions here the two yellow lines indicate the roads that come through and right up to the disputed point you can see that here okay this is the border this is the border okay so, and this are uh, the two important uh, the uh, critical road with a y fork here all right and this is a valley so the force forces that are prevalent which are positioned here including our air force bases etc are well in place so we are not on a weak wicket here we are on a strong wicket here china is on a weak wicket okay and i'll come to explain the strategy where china is probably miscalculated completely okay and this is another uh, same diagram explaining uh, you know uh, the different directions through which probably you can uh, you know appreciate the our position and their possible issues expanding this entire uh, diagram again and there is you know the border comes along here you know and this is our depiction of the border our trijunction is here this is the low line one here here is the button is border here by claiming this high line here with bhutan and also claiming this region pretty much they have actually created a border like this this is what the chinese claim line is and it pushes this line further down here but it is not just about like i explained uh shifting the line it is shifting the border through a very important geographical topographical feature and gives them height advantage or gives them a position which can create a parity to indian army's position okay and this is something completely unacceptable fundamentally they are wrong this is not the border the border that has been depicted and agreed and that are there on records is what originally india is indicating and what bhutan is indicating okay and this is further explanation of the same thing from the chinese uh, you know uh, sources how they have actually depicted the diagram i have explained this uh, fully now what will happen you know there is a lot of writings and you have somebody like uh, 
the british parliamentarian saying india will and china will go to war in one month and uh, there are others who are pred predicting a war etc what's going to happen are we fundamentally uh, the two countries are nuclear weapon states our nuclear positions and strengths are quite well known and they are matured nuclear weapon states they are not you know irrationality is not a major problem between the two sides and therefore there is a certain threshold beyond which you can't escalate now why has china escalated this problem here china has escalated this problem for a certain reasons which i'll explain you know subsequently but fundamentally it's for a strategic advantage there are economics that are involved the strategic competitions between the two countries that are involved both are rising powers and more importantly there are internal problems in china xi jinping is a president and in every leader in china while the communist party remains the powerful you know organization control over communist party's power center is important for the president of china and 19th chinese congress see in the uh, cmc will i mean chinese congress uh, uh, conference will take place in november and the former president uh, 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 and uh, and the uh, and another um, uh, guy the there are three guys who are vying to actually create control of the pla dominate the pla which is always an important element in the entire process as well as create their own regional power centers so i i mean of course a few days back somebody sent out an article saying china will now break up because these three power centers are fighting with each other so much that will never happen you know the warring states period was over 2500 years ago okay so a coalition power can emanate if xi jinping is not able to put these guys down a coalition of power can actually come to dominate which will be we can actually chinese position internationally xi jinping is a strong guy and therefore he has to dominate the the congress uh, i mean the uh, 19th congress of the communist party and if he has to dominate he has to actually also fire the nationalism into the entire chinese population if majority of the population actually goes behind them and create uh, you know uh, it, it's a the standard politics you know the standard politics that happens in every other country trump has done that it will happen in india as well and he is also doing that same thing so he has probably used an opportunity to get on to this but he is miscalculated because for 20 years he has seen india has been passive you make a noise you run there have been uh, umpteen times of intrusions and the political leadership doesn't make a noise or doesn't say okay let's diffuse it come to talks and this ha this has been the standard state behavior and based on that they've actually probably initiated this process but prime minister modi is actually given a different reaction to the entire process you stood your ground you told them you know we're not going to blink you better blink and move back first and you actually beefed up quietly so that is the fundamental reason why they they've increased their decibels they've increased their decibels to actually thinking they probably would convince the rest of the world they will show a lot of you know uh, their thing that india has done is kept quiet quietly beefed up its defenses and it stood its ground we are not going to move back and that's absolutely the correct thing and that comes also from your locational advantages i told you the geography favors us our position in that region favors us in spite of some of the changes that i'm going to indicate here here are the air fields that have been actually modernized over the last you know uh, a decade plus a new aircraft have come in they can operate these are all very high look elevation air fields technically you have a problem aircraft taking off from high altitudes there are complications that come into the entire process and therefore chinese air force was always weak in the tibetan region they can't operate easily but with modern aircraft and it's interesting to see the chinese have you know catapulted in the aerospace technology over the last 25 years so they operate now j10s the j11s which is like our su30s and they are now bringing in the fifth generation fighter aircraft they can bring in a reasonably effective you know air power into play should the balloon go up they also bring in an air defense process that is also there in that region so uh, the aerial position of the, the uh, process is strong but nevertheless 
they all operate at altitudes of 4 kilometers to 4.5 kilometers elevations of these airfields. That brings in its own problems. If you look at most of the force positioning with respect to the Chinese military has always been focused to the east. From the east you can come in towards the, uh, the Indian mainland, it's easier, but to be effective the Tibetan location and deployment is, is equally important. This is the uh, you know, basic focus towards the eastern side, which is fundamentally towards Taiwan strategy and anti-US strategy. If you look at the uh, ranges of the modern aircraft that they operate, they can pretty much reach inside uh, a reasonable distance into Indian territory as well, and even from the east. But the nature of the geography from the Indian side is fairly compact. So look at it from a country that's raising the conflict as a first mover, and look at his expanse and areas of defense. I, I showed you the eastern side that he has to have his forces deployed. He has to move forces from deep north down to the Tibetan region, and he has other disadvantages. Look at our region here. There are certain deficiencies. There are certain force structure issues. Nevertheless, the aircrafts indicate all the air bases that are located. All our air bases are located at an average altitude of 200 meters to 300 meters. Uh, none of our performance ever suffers here. And much of our Air Force strength depends on modern aircraft like Su-30s and the new aircraft will come. And we will beef up new forces here. So Air Power can play a major role in this entire process. And therefore, if the Chinese are willing to risk an adventure here, they're in for a huge surprise. Besides that, of course, the Army is moved in great strength and the Army is quite well beefed up there as well. Okay. So, the, if I sum up the fundamental issues, it is larger than just a pure boundary dispute. We are emerging powers. We are at the midst of a transformation of the international order, changing world order. And therefore, he is a rising power who wants to go up beyond the US. He doesn't want somebody else who can actually challenge him or somebody else who can pull him back. And therefore, 62 was somewhat similar in, in that context with, when you look at it from the non-line world and leadership of the non-line world. This is again, India is a rising power and much better organized this time. And therefore, to put you down, bring your image down in the international system will serve his purpose extremely well. There are many issues that come into play in all elements of this entire process. Economy, the Chinese economy is extremely strong. They are sitting on a pile of $3 trillion of reserves, cash reserves. They were 3.9 trillion just four years back. They dwindled down to some extent. But uh, do you have an idea how much is $3 trillion? 60 lakh crores, am I right? Somewhat 60 lakh crores. Okay, that is hard cash reserves beyond that. They have consistently on an average between 400 to 600 billion dollars of trade surplus every year. And this is the average. If you take the average from 1980 to now, the cash holding reserve has been $950 billion every year on an average. We're talking about when they're holding the 1980 was, uh, you know, a few hundred million dollars. Down to, uh, you know, now in 2017, on an, now you take the average, it's almost touching a trillion dollar. The trade surplus on an average touch touches close to $100 billion when you take from 1980 to now. But these days, their surplus is on a yearly average of 450 to $600 billion. So the clout through which China operates is huge economic clout. Okay, their influence is increasing. Their technology, they've done, they put their strategy, technology strategy quite well, and they dominate. They are the world's workshop. And, and that is how the trade surplus comes in. And they are, they've transformed their science and technology education processes quite well, and they're doing well. Their military is modernized, completely modernized. And getting modernized, they're reorganizing the military region into theater commands, and political leadership understands this process. There is a very good educational process and selection process, which brings in a political leadership which is very alive to the international ramifications and national interest process. And therefore, the whole process again comes down to 
how do you transform a world what are the pillars that needs to be attacked if you want to transform a world to your liking that's political economic and technical period right but economics is important so the us order the world order of post 1945 by taking control of the economic system of the world so the us and its allies set up the imf and the world bank and they are the two institutions and the bretton woods now of course the uh, you know multilateral trading uh, system that's come in wto is an instrument but they're all tailored towards retaining dominance of the us the us currency the us dollar is a universal currency you throw the dollar anywhere everybody will accept it your currency nobody will accept it beyond a certain immediate neighbors correct the us will go to war the day somebody challenges the us dollar to be a universal currency all right but that day will come the chinese are working on it so when people like iraq tried to do that iraq got demolished but the chinese is a huge superpower emerging superpower and they are working at it diligently and therefore they brick, put together bricks they are working with bricks although india and china are fighting but we are partners in BRICS game because BRICS is an important institution. The BRICS bank is a threat to the World Bank, is a threat to the IMF. They've created AIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is dominated by the Chinese, but the rest of the world is not playing, uh, you know, uh, piling onto it. And the OBOR will be the biggest churner of economic benefits and cultural benefits and influence benefits to China. And there comes the problem. India said, we are not with you on OBOR. And let me tell you, if India is not on board with China on OBOR, the OBOR is dead. And that's one of the most important problem areas between the two countries. So if you look at uh, analysis of a war that happened 2,500 years ago between Athens and Sparta, the two groups, the Peloponnesian War, and Thucydides describes it beautifully. You know, the cause of the war, the immediate cause of the war is just an alibi, any reason to light a fuse with a matchstick. So the border conflict can just be a matchstick. The underlying cause of the war is a fear that the rise of a power evokes in its neighboring challengers or neighboring countries. So the rise of Athens, its wealth and power, its strength, created such a fear in Sparta, it created a coalition to challenge Athens. And that's how the Peloponnesian War happened for 28 years, and the Greek system got demolished at the end of it all. Okay, so this is, you know, this, this history will continue, has repeated many times, will continue to repeat itself. We've got to be cautious of the entire process. Internal power struggle, I've explained to you. The military regions were seven. They've been reorganized. And the biggest military region is the Western Command, which covers the entire border region with, with India. Right? This is the OBOR issue. The thick, you know, maroon lines are the economic corridors. And look at the economic corridors that will flow up from China, from Xi'an, old traditional Xi'an, down to north, and then into, again, north of the central states, into Europe, down to Spain. You can see that. And you have the CPEC coming there, then you have the Eastern Corridor there coming through Myanmar and Thailand into India through Bangladesh. India is pretty much left out as a main player, but India is still required because they require economic power. The Maritime Silk Road is the blue shaded region that's indicated, again goes all the way to Europe. If this materializes the way Chinese want it, it is too much of a danger for smaller countries. They'll all get gobbled up. They'll become client states. It'll benefit Chinese economy immensely. And it'll service the Chinese economy constantly with other countries becoming resource providers. The Europe is an advanced economy, so there will be a problem. India is a power, rising power within itself, and there will be a problem. So the Chinese challenge is how to get them and create an OBOR, and OBOR has a, let me tell you, OBOR has a huge potential to be a great success. Not in the way the Chinese are projecting it. The Chinese need to understand to bring back the methodology that existed in historical Silk Road, why it succeeded, and bring that cooperative process that will actually work for them. That's it? Yeah, I think I've finished, okay.
No, there was some slide. Okay, I think I've taken enough time. We can probably discuss and uh, we'll look at more questions and answers subsequently. Thank you.